Okay, so biological embedding in, in historic perspective. <laughs> biological embedding is in the title of the uh, conference here. And um, it's something that emerged from our work in the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research. So I wanted to give a historical perspective on where it came from, which hopefully will color many of the other presentations you hear today. First off, the notion of biological embedding is inseparable from the notion of the emergence of socioeconomic gradients in health status. And so I'd like to take you back uh, 24 years to a uh, seven-hour meeting we had uh, at the head office of the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research where we had Sir Michael Marmot. This was before he was Sir, when he was just a plain old Michael Marmot and would talk to the likes of us. Um, uh, about the series of studies that were coming out of the British Civil Service uh, known as the Whitehall's family of studies, showing, like this does, that when you look at cumulative mortality followed prospectively, in this case over a 10-year period of time, that the mortality followed a gradient pattern. That was a stepwise decline gradually from the most privileged members of the civil servants, the Cambridge, Oxford types, to the sort of long-suffering white collars, to the clerical, to the people who would be doing more kind of menial and support tasks there. So a gradient, stepwise increase in uh, cumulative mortality over a 10-year period of time in populations that were all receiving a living wage and have full coverage of medical care, right? The meeting went on for seven hours because the idea that you could get a social gradient like this that couldn't be easily explained away by uh, absolute material uh, limitations or by access to medical care or by some sort of differential selection of one sort or another was very, very hard back 24 or 25 years ago to accept. Moreover, we had to come to accept the idea that when you dug into certain specific causes of death here, like heart disease mortality, that there's your 1, 2.1, 3.24, showing the fourfold gradient in mortality over this time, that when you look at the disease-specific risk factors, that these only explained a minority of the gradient, and the majority of the gradient seemed to be bound up in social position per se, one way or another. So this framed what uh, Len Syme, the epidemiologist at, at uh, Berkeley, called the challenge of the gradient. And I'd like to characterize the challenge of the gradient in this way, that once you accept the idea that a gradient like this is out there, you can dig through the world's literature from wealthy as well as majority world countries, and you can see gradients, stepwise increases in mortality, decreases in life expectancy, increases in, in health-adjusted life expectancy, and so forth, whether or not you develop divide the population up by income, education, or some sort of uh, category of occupational status and prestige. I collected these papers from 1987 to 1995, and I gave up after I had over 2,000 of them, and they were becoming a fire hazard. So there's a lot of this out there, right? Second, that it cuts across a wide range of disease processes, such that it is easier to say which diseases you don't get gradients for, like some of the gynecological cancers and malignant melanoma, than it is to say the ones that you do. Third, that generally speaking what we showed for uh, CHD is true for the other conditions, that by and large the gradient appears to be inherent in social position somehow or another and cannot be easily explained away by disease by disease risk factors. That it has the capacity, if you go back 100 years where such data exists, and look at the way in which it loads on the infectious diseases that used to knock people off, and then the middle part of the 20th century, things like heart disease entered society uh, through those who were privileged enough to live long enough to get it, but by the 1950s had settled into a gradient, and for those of you who've watched HIV and AIDS, it has settled into a gradient pattern now from the 1980s through to present. So the capacity for the gradient to replicate itself on new conditions as they emerge, to occur among both males and females, for males loading more on things that kill you but don't make you too sick, for women on things that make you sick and don't kill you. So if you do uh, disability adjusted life years, the steepness of, of uh, gradients for males and females tends to come out about the same flattens up, I'm going to come back to in a 25-minute talk, I probably won't be able to talk about very much. But the key point here, 
is that when you deal with all of that stuff up above, which completely does not fit the kind of biology and pathology that people are taught in medical school, you have to start asking yourself where the origins are of resilience and vulnerability that can cut so broadly across conditions and uh, replicate themselves in new conditions as they come into society. In the late 1980s, this was confused by the fact that most of the work that was done in childhood was based on uh, medical outcomes per se. And it wasn't until we got to this concept of developmental health and started looking at physical, social, emotional, language, and cognitive uh, development that you could see that in fact the gradient was, as we say, beginning life as a gradient in developmental health which helped to start frame where to go looking for, uh, for this sort of thing. And so, you know, if we go to the kind of thing that, you know, Shankoff and Phillips in their book and Chuck Nelson have been, uh, you know, doing a great job of compiling, then you have this idea, basically, that early on in life, because of the sensitive periods in brain and biological development, that in a socially partitioned world, what we could be looking at here is something that, at least in part, begins as a grand interaction between the opportunities for stimulation, support, nurturance, and participation in the early years, and the dense network of sensitive periods in brain and biological development, wherein the organism is sensitive, in a sense, to the environments that it is growing up in. Right? And so that was the grand idea that we began to work with. Um, uh, to operationalize it then, we, um, through um, the WHO Commission on the so Social Determinants of Health, we took the original Yuri Bronfenbrenner idea of a bioecological model. For those of you who know about him, people always draw these things and say, well, this is a Bronfenbrenner model. But if you read Bronfenbrenner, he never once drew one of these things. He wrote about it, but he wasn't into it. Anyway, this is our model, the one that we sold to the WHO. And the point that it's trying to make here is that development, to a certain extent, is an emergency property of the, of the interactions that occur between the child who brings to the table windows of opportunity, a temperament, various predispositions, predispositions of one sort or another, and conditions as they exist in the family, in broader neighborhood areas, in regions, in relational communities of identity, and at the level of the nation and, and the globe, and that the interactions, direct or indirect, ought to be really, really important, and the outcomes ought to be some sort of an emergent property of that. So in fact, if you take a model like this and you add to it um, the issue of programs and services, then you can talk about the state of children's development, you know, by the time, let's say, they reach school age as being an emergent property of the ecosystem in which they are growing up in. So we developed. Uh, under the auspices of the old CIFAR program in human development and under the leadership of the late Dan Offord, a tool called the EDI, or the Early Development Instrument, that was meant to serve as a tool, if you'd like, of ecosystem health for the state of children's development. In other words, we go directly, let's just go through this here, Early Development Instrument, so we call it a population-based measure because what we do with this is we go directly to the kindergarten teachers uh, who the kids know for several months and get them to fill out these forms on the kids that take about 15 or 20 minutes to fill out. And they have information on the kids' social competence, emotional maturity, language and cognitive development, communication skills, and physical health and well-being, all domains that matter. Uh, for the balance of the life course. It's not a test, it's, it's a, a kind of like a report card that the teachers fill out based on knowing the kids. But because it only takes 15 or 20 minutes per child to fill out, you can basically buy kindergarten teachers out of the day of their time, get them to fill out these things on all their kids, and if you can get the public school systems and the independent schools involved, then you can generate population-based data on the state of children's development. And so this is, in a sense, to the qualities of the ecosystems that kids are growing up in, what, you know, the count of healthy spawning rates might be like to, to uh, characterize the health of an ocean and river system that has to support something like salmon, right? That kind of idea. So it's meant to be an ecosystem uh, measure, and so we try to include all children in the transition year into school in this. Now when we do, 
You can look at wealthy countries like Australia, and this is looking at the fraction of the children who come up vulnerable or behind where we'd like them to be on one or more of the scales of the EDI. And what you can see when you look at them according to family income level, there's our friend the gradient there, starting uh, with a vulnerability rate of about 11% among the families in the top 10% and then gradually going up to about 35% of those in the bottom. So an example from a wealthy country there. Similarly, if we go to a middle-income country like Jamaica, same kind of thing is emerging there. Uh, so this idea then that early on when you have population-based data that allow you to see it and to commensurate it, if you'd like, with chronic disease and mortality data, that the gradients are emerging very, very early on in life in socially partitioned societies. What we've been doing in British Columbia, actually, is gone out and we've done this four times over in the last 10 years. And we've organized the province, there it all is, uh, according to 480 neighborhoods. And we look at the vulnerability rates that we see on the EDI according to the neighborhoods. Now, this should be dark green, light green, yellow, light brown, and dark brown. But the, uh, when we got the contrast up for that, everything else disappeared. So you'll have to accept that. The point is, you can see them in the dark green areas here where the vulnerability rates are below 16% and some of the red areas where they're above 35%. And indeed, what we find across the province, this is the fourth wave, is that the lowest vulnerability neighborhoods here are below 5% and the highest vulnerability neighborhoods are over 60%. Now we've done this four times and every time out, we have some areas that are south of 5% and other places that are north of 60%. So the idea that when you actually look at kids organized in neighborhoods where family, neighborhood, access to program and service issues, socioeconomic issues, and all the rest of it combine in unique ways that you get differences as much as 20-fold across one of the richest jurisdictions in one of the richest countries of the world has now become a commonplace. So the point I'm trying to make here, first off, is that the contribution of early chances in terms of generating gradients that can go on to influence health, well-being, learning, and behavior across the balance of the life course is by no means trivial. And so the question of biological embedding of early experience is no means trivial. The other thing that I want to point out before I go on is that when you generate data like this, you can get at not only individual facts, but social facts. So for those of you who are not familiar with Durkheim, he talks about the idea that if you decide to commit suicide, or if she does, that is an individual fact. But in your society, the suicide rate is a social fact. And what we know is that quite often the determinants of social facts are not the same as the determinants of individual facts. And what we've discovered depressingly over the last 10 years in BC with these kind of data, that whereas the differences in individual children's developmental status by the time they reach school age is very much dependent on the most intimate environments that they are in, that the determinants of the pattern and trends of the rates of children's development are much more sensitive actually to the more distal factors what's going on in the economy, the number of working hours per year that parents have to put in in order to maintain a given socioeconomic level and so forth. So there's a very, very interesting interplay here between the individual and the social facts. Now what all this then does is it frames the concept of biological embedding. And biological embedding in a sense was a consilience concept. In other words, it was meant to be something that started and it was anchored in our observations of populations that then pointed towards the biological world and said that if the population trends look like this, then when you get under the skin, it's got to look like that. Okay? So the idea was that there were three criteria for biological embedding. First is that experience can, in fact, get under the skin and alter human biodevelopment. So far, so good. Second point, and this is a really important one, that systematic differences in experience in different social environments can lead to systematically different biodevelopmental states so that a socially partitioned world will produce socially partitioned differences in biodevelopment on average. And that finally, we're not talking here about, you know, that your, you know, your milieu interior functions differently if you've got a cold than when it doesn't. We're talking about the idea that differences are stable and long-term. 
such that they have the capacity to influence health, well-being, learning, and behavior over the life course. Anyway, we generated this inference in 1999, long before many of the biological phenomena that we're talking about today were actually understood, and then, in a fact, went hunting for it, right? Now, before I get into the hunt for it, um, I just want to take a step back and say, well, if it is real, if biological embedding is real, then it's got to have been going on for an awful long time, and the question might be, then, why are we only talking about it now? Um, there are a few interesting historical examples that are worth thinking about here that get at the degree to which ideology, as much as anything else, can become a barrier or an opportunity for being able to understand things that are staring us in the face. And so, for instance, if you go back to William Harvey's discovery that blood circulates, which came out in the 1630s, basically, what you discover there is that his discovery followed a hundred year struggle that began with Copernicus and involved Kepler and ultimately Galileo, breaking the theological notion that the earth was at the center of the universe and that heavenly bodies circulated. Therefore, circulation was heavenly motion and that earthly motion had to be ebbs and flows. And accordingly, the notion of blood was that you had the dark blood that ebbed and flowed and the light blood that ebbed and flowed, right? So that's the venous blood and the arterial blood, and that was the idea. Well, anyway, there was Harvey at the University of Padua at the time that the victory over the church finally happened, who was then able to say, you know what, circulation can occur. It's, it's an earthly motion because the earth is actually circulating around the sun, therefore, therefore the blood can circulate, right? So interesting kind of example. Another example when we think about the whole business about physical chemical exposures with latent effects. There, you know, for those of you who know the asbestos story, um, life insurance companies quietly stopped insuring anybody who worked with asbestos for uh, life insurance policies around about 1919. However, in terms of official recognition that there was this latent physical chemical thing where you could be exposed to asbestos now and develop mesothelioma three decades later and all the rest of it, the official recognition of that and compensation for it and, you know, uh, Irving Selikoff and all that took place about uh, 50 years later. That, that came in the late 60s and early 70s. So there, in effect, the struggle between labor and capital became a rate-limiting step on what it was that could be seen in that case. So here we are at the end of the 20th and the beginning of the 20th century getting into social causation and these kind of things. And so one could ask why now? And I would pose that there are a few things that are helpful. One is what I'm going to call the historical evidence of the McEwen type. That is to say, Thomas McEwen, um, a graduate of the University of British Columbia, I will say, in 1941, who then, in the middle of World War II, moved to England. Weird. Not to fight, you know, anyway, that's what he did. Anyway, he was the one who really demonstrated better than anybody else that uh, the reasons that wealthy societies' life expectancies are at 70 years and above as opposed to 45 years and below primarily has to do with socioeconomic changes and things that fell out of socioeconomic changes and not through to medical breakthroughs and immunization and the kind of things that we normally talk about. So this idea that social progress trumps medical intervention, followed by the emergence during the 20th century of post-scarcity societies for the first time, where you still, of course, see socioeconomic gradients in, in health status, right? You know, you can go back 100 years ago, and it would be very difficult to identify a true post-scarcity society, but at least until global warming and the financial collapse catches up with us, there are a few of us still out there at the moment. New statistical capacity to falsify explanations and insights from longitudinal and birth cohort studies. In other words, the capacity to actually do complex modeling of longitudinal data sets that could factor out differential selection processes and say that the primary causal arrow does need to go somehow or another, or a primary causal arrow needs to go from the experiences that people are having towards the outcomes. 
Next one, and I think the one that's most interesting, is really this notion of democratic ideologies that don't accept race and class prejudices so quickly as explanatory models. Here, the early work on gradients was done at the end of the 19th and early 20th century by the likes of Francis Galton. And their interpretation of that data was that it showed the genetic superiority of the upper classes. And so it was used to justify eugenics and also to create this funny nexus between feminism and eugenics where you know, trying to convince working class women to not have kids was going on, right? So that's what it was. So much so that when we decided that we wanted to become a gradient program in the late 80s, there were still people in England that thought we must be a, a fascist organization. So that's, uh, that's one example. Uh, the other example is, is if you read the wonderful work that's been done on the history of causal thinking in relation to tuberculosis, what you see is that back in the 19th century, when everybody was susceptible to tuberculosis, it was understood that it must have some sort of environmental causes, which were soon to be un uh, uh, identified. But as rates of tuberculosis dropped among privileged populations, the causal models moved towards the blame the victim sort of thing, so that by the 1940s in the United States, States, it was respectable to go to respiratory conferences and speak about the Negro lung as being a uniquely susceptible thing to, uh, to uh, tuberculosis. So the point is, is that we are now in an era where political acceptability means that we tend to put those hypotheses further down the, the, the line and are prepared to allow social causation, a sense of incumbency, enough so that you can get a grant or two to study it, um, which is always nice. Okay, and then finally, of course, the emerging evidence of biological mechanisms. And the way that people like me think about this uh, is to think in sort of an archaeological metaphor, that if there is biological embedding, it's got to occur at various levels, right? So there's got to be thing at the level of the whole organ system going on, at the organ, at the cell, and finally at the gene. So one can think, if you think about archaeology as digging, digging holes in the ground, what do you hit at the top and what do you hit further down? So if you want to think about the shallow archaeology, then, you know, with a nod to... Uh, to Dan Keating's ideas here, the idea that there are certain key transduction systems that are meant to deal with the relationship between the body and the, uh, the social environment. So of course, the HP axis comes to play and cortisol, the ANS system, epinephrine, norepinephrine, the prefrontal cortex, executive function, focused attention, that sort of thing. Um, social affiliation systems in the deep part of the brain, amygdala locus aurelius, and then the immune system in terms of its function as a kind of a peripheral brain. So we would, and many, many people are, of course, looking for evidence of biological embedding at that level. And I won't go through all of that, but just one factoid that I'm going to give you from the research we did in BC is prefrontal cortex function. Now, I have to say, the best work in the world, I think, in this is the work that's going on in Oregon. And I'm not going to claim that our work is as good as that. But the reason that I've put this up here is because this can be situated in the EDI vulnerability maps. So what we've got here are kids who grew up in brown areas on that map. So they, I mean, green areas on the map that happen to be, as we say, on diagonal. So these are kids from a region in the province where it was high socioeconomic and low vulnerability. And these kids are low socioeconomic, high vulnerability. We got them in primary grades when you could get the ERP shower cap on their heads without the going crazy. And to make a long story short, in relation to a uh, task that required focused attention, these kids have got the focused attention notch and these kids don't, right? This is what happens when you let epidemiologists go on this kind of data. This is the level of interpretation you get. Anyway, that's what I see there. And the point is, the point is, is that you can relate this kind of thing back to those maps, right? That these are the kids in the green zones, and these are the kids in the brown zone. And the philosophical problem, of course, we have is, is that this is a perfectly good adaptation, one would think, to growing up in a world that is threatening, unpredictable, and chaotic. And if I were to refight World War I, I want this guy in the trench beside me, right? Because this person over here is going to light three cigarettes in a row and get their head blown off, right? But nonetheless, this is, this is the phenotype of the 21st century. Right? This is the uh, focused attention thing, right? So, you know, raises some very interesting questions about the interaction between the kind of nurturance signals that kids are getting and concordance and discordance with the world in which they're going to have to live. However, if we move on then to um, the deep archaeology, this is where the social epigenetics comes in. And thanks to Marla for having explained this stuff. So all I have to do is report out a few results. I want to say, basically, that for me, 
you know, is one of the people who came up with the idea of biological embedding that, that, that I've gotten you know, all over this because social epigenetics, if real, fulfills all of the criteria that we were in effect looking for. And so a number of us have been trying these rather high risk, slightly heroic fishing expeditions, looking at whole of genome in relation to social differences. And so I'm going to quickly describe two studies here that have got to do with taking biological samples, blood and, uh, and uh, buccal samples, and looking backwards in time 15 to 40 years to see about whether or not we pick up signals of early experience experience uh, on the epigenome. Anyway, the first one is the 1958 British birth cohort study that involved myself, Chris Power, Marcus Pembry, Moisha Schiff, and his great laboratory team in Montreal. Uh, involved a small selection of 40 adult males selected from extremes of SES in both childhood and adulthood according to a factorial design. So these are kids born first week of March 1958 in Britain. So tw 10 low, low socioeconomic status, 10 high, high, 10 high, low, 10 and low high, dividing childhood and adulthood. Uh, Genome-wide methylation analysis using blood from at age 45. 20,000 promoter regions looked at. So we, you know, we did, we tried to look at the whole thing. Anyway, to make a long story short, um, the methylation patterns strongly related to published gene expression levels, which is a concern. Uh, highly non-random distribution of uh, variably methylated promoters. Anyway, to get to the bottom line here, we found 1,252 promoter regions differentially methylated according to childhood SEP. Smaller uh, footprint with the adult SEP. And even though we did the factorial design, it was the childhood socioeconomic position that really stood out here. So uh, 6% of the DNA differentially methylated in that study. Uh, different signaling pathways. Final study I'm going to make. I can see, yes, the Grand Inquisitor is standing there. <laughs> Our study involving from Maryland Essex uh, cohort uh, from uh, Wisconsin, looking at mother's stress and father's stress in the early years in relation to differential methylation in buccal cells using an alumina method here. And basically, to make a long story short, we found 139 differentially methylated genes according to mother's stress, but not father's stress in the first 18 months of life. Uh, a smaller but real signature of father's stress in the pre uh, school period, so after, you know, more age three and four, in relation to uh, girls, right? So these, these two studies have just come out in the literature in the last uh, couple of months, and there's more to come. Uh, so I think we're into an era now of starting to be able to ask and answer questions about the degree to which socially partitioned uh, experiences do get under the skin and may influence developmental trajectories across the life course. And I will finish by simply saying that Fraser Mustard in his last two weeks of life when he was unconscious most of the time, every once in a while would come out of unconsciousness and his son Jim reported that one point when he came out of unconsciousness he said, it's got to be the microRNA, it's got to be the microRNA, and then went back and yeah. So thank you for listening.